Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Laurie Jones, the Managing Director of ME Action. ME Action is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to advocating for and with people with myalgic encephalomyelitis or ME-CFS. ME is a devastating condition that affects millions of people around the world. 80% of people develop ME post-infection with an increased number of people developing ME after major viral outbreaks. A year into the COVID-19 pandemic, we are unfortunately welcoming new people into our community that have had long COVID and are now being diagnosed with ME. So that makes today a crucially important conversation for the millions more developing ME, for the future of research, and for the understanding of the general public. We're excited to present our panelists, each of whom have unique insights to offer about long COVID and its relationship to ME-CFS. They are researchers and clinicians who have spent years investigating ME-CFS and people with lived experience of ME-CFS and long COVID. Um, I want to provide a quick overview of ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, a chronic fatigue syndrome. And as we've heard, it's a chronic debilitating illness often post-viral, it's very uniquely characterized by impaired uh, ability to function, less tolerance for activity, and that can be physical, cognitive, and upright activity um, in association with fatigue. But even more important, patients experience post-exertional malaise or a relapse or increase in illness symptoms after attempting to engage in physical, cognitive, or upright activity. And the consequences of post-exertional malaise may last several days or even weeks. In addition, patients, the core symptoms of ME-CFS include sleep disturbances, cognitive impairments, and orthostatic intolerance, which is a, a big word that just means symptoms escalate when upright and, and they improve when lying down. There are many causes of uh, orthostatic intolerance, including deconditioning, but the most insidious is uh, disease of the autonomic nervous system. And this manifests as uh, hypotension, tachycardia, and, and a myriad of symptoms in the upright position. And um, MECFS patients also experience, uh, frequently experience pain, painful headaches, muscle or joint aches, and allergies and sensitivities. And the cause is often unclear because the diagnosis is often uh, delayed for months or years after onset of their illness. We are observing many overlapping symptoms between long COVID patients and ME-CFS patients. And you may have reviewed the preprint that uh, was uh, uh, available in late December. That's an international web-based survey of suspected and confirmed COVID cases with more than 3,700 respondents from 56 countries, uh, mostly the US and the UK. And even more importantly, most of the participants were not hospitalized with COVID, yet three quarters are reporting symptoms suggestive of ME-CFS after six months. And the most frequently reported symptoms by these long COVID patients were, and this sounds familiar, fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and cognitive dysfunction, along with a significant amount of chest symptoms, tachycardia, dizziness, insomnia or sleep problems, and headache, muscle, or joint aches. And most had not returned to work by six months after their acute illness. People with long COVID um, may not have lasting detectable damage to their lungs, heart, kidneys, uh, but they will be left nevertheless with fatigue and the other symptoms that Dr. Bateman described. It's my bet uh, that long COVID is gonna to prove to be caused by certain kinds of abnormalities in the brain. Some of the same abnormalities that have been already identified in MECFS. Research is gonna determine whether that's right or wrong. It's my hope and strong recommendation that the abnormalities identified already in MECFS be included in any studies of long COVID. And also my hope that in any studies of long COVID, there'll be comparison groups with MECFS studied alongside the long COVID patients. Uh, with COVID, of course, we diverted a lot of efforts towards it. But at the same time, we haven't lost our emphasis on MECFS. But through the COVID, we've learned a lot. 
I think that's the important thing because we got autopsy brain tissues. We could look at what's happening there. Now with MECFS has been very hard to do so. We got a very um, a unique cohort of individuals who otherwise didn't have respiratory problems, um, but died suddenly. So these are not individuals who had multi-organ failure and then all kinds of pathology in the brain, but actually these are individuals who otherwise could have potentially survived and could have developed long-term complications that could have resembled long, uh, long haul COVID. So we had unique opportunities to look at the brain in that way. And so we've published our findings already. And those things are informing us about how to now investigate our uh, uh, long haul COVID patients. And we've learned from what we were doing with the MECFS patients to use that to study the long haul patients. So it goes back and forth for both ways. You learn from one, you apply it to the other, and so on and so forth. Along the way, advice from others with chronic illnesses and a physician friend with ME proved invaluable. The advice from the ME community was to pace, do not progressively exercise, know your energy limits, and do not breach them. And that the first one to three years were of most importance to avoid irreparable harm. Many of these people have been ill for decades and are now homebound. That was shocking to me. As a nurse and a patient with long COVID or post-acute sequela of COVID, I've read everything I can and I'm left with few answers from the medical community yet. It is clear that there's not enough evidence-based care informed by previous infectious illnesses and people with ME. With COVID-19, I'm still hearing it's a mystery. It took little time for studies on immune responses and clinical trials for the critically ill to emerge. Post-COVID clinics aimed at post-ICU follow-up, as well as long COVID or PASC, have quickly formalized. Still, my care is siloed into specialty areas for each symptom without addressing the root cause and proposing treatments. With the estimated 10% of COVID-19 infections developing into long COVID, I believe healthcare, the system of healthcare is at an inflection point in treating chronic neuroimmune illness. So here's my main message. It is really encouraging that the NIH has 1.15 billion to spend on further PASC or long COVID research. But with symptomatology that is so similar to other post-viral illnesses or ME, it is imperative that the experience of the ME community be examined as well. Research needs to include the study of ME pathophysiology, which will hopefully lead to better treatments and outcomes for both ME and long COVID. I am Ashanti Daniel, a disabled registered nurse and person with myalgic encephalomyelitis or ME. I am also a single mother of two, and in case you hadn't noticed, a black woman. You may be wondering why I pointed out my race. Stay tuned and you'll find out. But first, let me start by taking you back to August, 2016. I was living my best life, working in my dream career as a neonatal intensive care unit and congenital cardiac ICU nurse. I was an active single parent and working out vigorously five, sometimes six days a week. I was literally the picture of health. When the enterovirus family, specifically Coxsackie B virus, blindsided me, taking my career and life as I knew it with it. I'm assuming you all know what structural racism is. If not, Google it. Okay, seriously. As it stands right now, Black people with ME, a disease that has historically been perceived to be a quote, white woman's disease, struggle to get diagnosed. Now we're adding a significant number of Black COVID long haulers to a healthcare system that is already inherently biased towards us. The COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the intersection of structural racism and health and highlights why we need to address structural racism now. Structural racism is the common denominator and underlying condition fueling disparities in COVID-19 and preventing Black people from being diagnosed with ME. Studies have shown 50%, that's half of white medical students and residents false beliefs about biological differences between Black and white people. This is frightening as these are the doctors of our future. Structural racism is a public health crisis and clearly we have a lot of work to do to change that. Um, it's clear from our conversation today that MECFS has to be part of our overall conversation regarding long COVID. Some people with long COVID are going to go on to be diagnosed with MECFS because MECFS was an expected outcome of the pandemic. 
and because research in one disease is going to be essential to inform the other. Only through integrating our knowledge and experiences can we make progress to understanding what causes these different post viral diseases and lead to effective and available treatments for everybody. And if anyone has follow up questions, please email Adrian at press at emmyaction.net and she'll be able to answer those questions. Thank you so much, Jamie, for moderating. Thank you to the entire panel. And on behalf of Emmy Action, thank you for all, um, thank you all for attending and we're happy to answer any follow-up questions that you have. Have a great day.